Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter for week 30 of Ask a Crafter. It's late. We're shooting the video late. It's after eight. And I'm rhyming like Dr. Seuss. <laughs> oh, we get silly when it's, I do anyway, when it's night. I'm going to start with some comments so we can actually get through our questions today. Um, Linan says, uh, this is, oh, this is Kathy, by the way, in case you forgot to mention it. Oh, I'm nice. off my game. I'm, back I, I'm completely out of the loop here. Um, Linan writes, uh, hi, Lindsay. I wanted to get this out to Maureen and Sharon, but I wanted to let everybody know those interested. Um, she found a paper that she thinks surpasses Tim Holtz watercolor paper, and it is called Strathmore Mixed Media 140 pound vellum surface. So it's a smooth paper. Um, so just make sure when you're looking for it, you look for the word vellum surface on it and you'll have a nice appropriate paper for stamping and watercolor painting with the distress markers. Um, and also last week I asked for your help on um, some homemade jelly plate tools. Well, there were a lot of ideas submitted both on my blog and under the video on YouTube. So if you're looking for some jelly plate tool ideas, please um, refer back to that blog post and that video and you'll get tons and tons of ideas. So thank you so much for pitching in with those ideas, guys. Well, what do we have for questions this week, Ak? Okay, well, first up is Lynn Burden. Hi, Lindsay. I have been binge-watching the Ask a Crafter episodes. <laughs> That's the best thing you can do, binge. There's nothing wrong with binge-watching the videos. As long as there's no ice cream involved. <laughs> Somewhere back there, you, should sh you showed a craft room tour. When you opened one of the drawers, there were some different colors of rubberized shelf liner. I was shopping at a dollar store recently and found about five different colors for cheap. My first thought was, I need these because the frugal crafter has them in her craft space. I talked myself down because my craft is quilting. My question, finally, is what do you do with this product? I want to get them before they sell out if I will need this craft in my life. You are the best. Hi from South Carolina. Um, I don't think they're going to sell out. They're always there. I got mine at the Dollar Tree probably, I don't know, eight years ago. Um, I've used them. I've die cut them um, and used them like die cut flowers and use them on scrap yep, pages. Yep. Um, I've used them for texture. Like on the jelly plate, you can press them down there and lift them up and get texture. Or you can cut stamps out of them because it'll give you a really, like if you cut a heart, you'd have a heart kind of in a, in a modeled type of pattern. Um, you can use it to keep your tools from sliding around on your table. So if you're using like a big shot, you can put some of that down and put your big shot on top and it's gonna keep it from shaking around. I should do that more often. Yeah. Um, keep it from shaking yeah. it around while you're using it. Um, you can also put it like if you were hammering out some wire for jewelry and you were hammering it like on a wood block, you could lay that on your table under your wood block and that would cushion, cushion. Yeah. and um, save your table, also save a little Sound. noise. Yeah, yeah so um, you know, it's just whenever you want that kind of funky, meshy look. It's cheap, it's colorful, it's fun um, and it's actually useful my husband's used it in his um, workshop when he's trying to keep things from sliding around where he's working. I think he keeps a piece pretty much right in front and center on his desk and it does last quite a bit. So that's what I use it for. Whether they can decide whether it's worth it, worth the dollar or not for it. <laughs> okay, and Al PRN79, what printer will print on stamping up cardstock? My Epson gave out, got an HP, and returned it. Well, um, the key, it's not, doesn't really matter the brand, but um, that cardstock is very thick and it, you want to use it in a printer that loads from the back so the paper does not have to be folded in half. So I have an HP PhotoSmart and I occasionally print on the Stampin' Up! paper, but half the time it jams. So the way it goes through my printer, so if it's going in the bottom and then it has to curve, bend in half and come back through the front and it always, well at least half the time it jams and I have to take the back of the printer off and yank it out of there. Oh, really? So you want a top loading machine for that because on a top loading machine your paper is like that it goes and it just slides out. Yeah. Exactly. So it doesn't have to make that sharp bend which is difficult for thick paper. So I can't print on like watercolor paper or the Stampin' Up! cardstock very easily and I, when I do it I have to do it one sheet at a time. So if you're having a problem with your printer try one sheet at a time before you go buy a new one but you're better off with a top loading printer if you're going to print on the thick material. Okay. And Stacy says, hello, my daughter recently brought home a pile of dried out fabric dye markers by FabricMate. Can I revive these with glycerin? If so, should I try to remove the nibs or just soak the tips? I don't think glycerin's going to cut it. Um, the nature of fabric markers is that they're permanent on fabric, so the felt tips on the pen and inside the felt pad inside that's holding the ink is fabric and if it's dry then it's probably permanent in there. One thing you might try is some denatured alcohol or rubbing alcohol if you don't have denatured alcohol. Denatured alcohol is more potent so it can dissolve Release things. That, things a yeah. Better than, um, yeah. And then you want to test it on a swatch before you work on something that you really um, 
counting on being right because it might you may get the ink to release but it may not become permanent when you use it so um, try that it might make them juicy again try it on a scrap and wash it and if it doesn't come out then you're good to go that's the only thing i can really think of that's going to um that's going to revive those fabric markers because they're meant to be permanent okay k burns asks i would like some guidance on what size and type brushes to start with for water watercolor painting <laughs> so I'm like, I'm just from it's night it's late. jersey <laughs> we got all kinds of interesting accents going on um uh, actually, there's three brushes that I really recommend for a beginner watercolor. One is a um, one inch flat. Um, it's also called a wash brush. And I could probably grab one, actually. I've got several buckets. Yeah, I can. Is there a particular brand name I, too that you could um, maybe recommend? I like the Aqualon, and um, they're on sale all the time for forty percent off at AC Moore. Not you know every day, but you know every other week or so. Or you can use a coupon. Um, so this is what the Aqualons look like. Um, this is another brush by Royal. It's very similar, but this is like a one inch wash. Oh, maybe three quarter, but I'd go for a one inch wash. Um, a number 10 round, a number six round, and um, I'd also get a, uh, a half inch wash, or oh, that's four brushes, a half inch wash that um, that is a nice uh, synthetic brush. Part in the furnace. It's only 43 degrees. Um, no, it's 53. 53 okay. degrees down here. Um, but these brushes will serve you very well. In fact, if I only could pick one brush, it would be a number 10 round because you have a really fine point and you can do really tiny details. Or when you press the brush down, you can actually get a really wide band of color. So these three, these four brushes will do you well. Um, I would recommend those. And you might even find them in a multi pack um, by. Royal Lang Nickel, either the Aqualon or the Majestic line. They're very affordable and they're top quality brushes. I really like them. And they're all synthetic, which means no animals were harmed in the making of your paintbrush. What's next? Okay. Um, sorry about the pronunciation. I'll apologize beforehand, but Sheik and uh, Freddie, I am looking for a good paper for painting. I use 135 gram paper, but I find the paper coming off and spoils my painting. I'm a beginner and I find it very difficult to paint on. All right, um, 135 gram is pretty thin. Um, you, and you want a paper that's got a good amount of sizing in it. And sizing is basically like a coating that's on the paper that protects the paper. So you can paint on it, but the paint will kind of flow rather than absorb. And um, the paper fibers, fibers will say stuck down well rather than pilling up. And also better quality paper uses longer fibers of, uh, of cotton. Um, so you don't have those the little linty bits. Yeah, so you don't have those little linty bits kind of uh, floating around. Um, a good moderately priced paper for painting would be Canson Montville, and um, you can find them. Uh, I don't know where where this person's from. Oriental Trading carries it, and they have a price match guarantee. If you find it cheaper anywhere else, they'll beat the price by 10%. So I know they carry the Canson Montville. Mm -hmm. um, they also carry Arches, which is supreme, gorgeous. My favorite paper. It's expensive. But, um, but again, they price match, so Oriental Trading. I'll put a link below for that. I should give you a pen. This, might, this pen might work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would try either that or the, uh, the New Mix Media Pad from Canson. I have good luck painting with ink. If I could only pick one paper, though, I, I would go with a nice 140 pound, I think that's 260 gram um, watercolor paper. Um, Canton Montville is a good middle of the road paper that I think you'll have some good results on and it won't cost you too much. Okay, pretty blimp. Just a quick question. How much water can you add to acrylics before they won't stick to paper? I saw another video to you that said to use no more than 30% water. Thanks. Lindsay and assistant. <laughs> well, the, the good thing about doing it on paper is that you can thin it way down. It's the paper is going to absorb it. So you don't have to worry about the binder when you're sticking it to paper like you would if you were on canvas or wood. So if you're trying to really thin it down and work on canvas, um, if you do another wash over it, you might lift up some of that paint because there's not enough binder to stick it down. But think about when you spill food coloring on a piece of paper or you spill food coloring on, a, on your tablecloth. It's there. It's stuck. You know, that's the same thing mm -hmm. with the paper. The, the color is going to absorb a bit. And, you know, watercolor doesn't have a lot of binder in it. And it sticks just fine to paper. It's not like you're going to be running it under the hose or anything. So um, so I think you can thin it down as much as you want for paper. Canvas, on the other hand, I wouldn't go more than thinning it down 30% if you want it to stick to canvas. Fabric, you can thin it down for fabric. I would add a little texture, I mean, a little uh, fabric medium just to, you know, keep it supple and make sure it really is stuck down to the fabric good. But for paper, you really don't have to worry about it that much. Okay. Pat in Canada asks, I have to paint a red rose on a wooden box, 
but find the red does not look a deep red no matter how many coats of paint I put on it. Should I undercover the area first with some other color before I add the red paint and and if so can you suggest a color to use that might help? Absolutely here's a deal with the color red. Red's my favorite color by the way <laughs> I can tell. Um, if you paint um, under it with like a golden yellow like if you take yellow and white and mix it so you've got kind of like a a buttery yellow anywhere between like a buttery to a yellow ochre and you paint that down uh, so you have your rose you have your background you've painted your rose paint the rose in that buttery yellow first let it dry then go over it with the red paint and you'll have really vivid rich color and if you need some darker shadows this is going to seem completely um, counterintuitive but you take your red add a little bit of green to it and that will darken it down naturally so it looks like you have a natural shadow rather than adding black to it which will look artificial you add a little bit of green try the green that you might have used for the leaf and add that to your red and use that for a shadow color and you'll have a beautiful um, realistic deep red rose. Wow excellent I never would have thought of that. <laughs> Kind of theory. My first thought, well, my first thought really would have been to like put a gray under because I thought that's something that I'd heard as far as like they when you're painting with gray red, on walls, red, yeah. red on walls, but that sounds much more, na you know, it will glow to, to yeah. a nature color yeah. so that you would find some. Cool. Okay, Sienna Eccles, what beginning drawing supplies would you recommend? I'm planning on starting to draw more and I have no idea what to buy. Well, the great thing about drawing is you can use whatever you have access to. You can use a carpenter's pencil. You could use a stick of charcoal out of the fire pit. You know, you can use whatever you like. Um, but I will show you a few products that I have that you may find useful. My favorite pencil is an ebony pencil. Um, this is what the box looks like. I bought them by the dozen because I really like them. And they are a really thick lead pencil. I'll show you here. These aren't sharpened yet. But you probably maybe see, put that woo close up, um, like a 3D. If this is a 3D video, it would be like <laughs> poking you in the eyeball. Um, it's got a really thick lead, kind of like a Prismacolor. Um, and it's got a nice, um, rich graphite color. It's great for because you can use light pressure or you can use deep pressure. You can smudge it with your fingers. It's, um, it's a really great drawing tool. I've used these since I was five. My art teacher recommended these when I was oh. five, and I've loved them ever since. Um, something you might want to treat yourself to is a, um, a little set of pencils. And the nice thing about that is you get a very, you get a variety of pencils in different, um, uh, I don't want to say blackness. It's more like different hardness. So you get about, I don't know, 12 pencils. And this range goes from an 8B, which is super, super dark and soft, a super soft dark lead, all the way down to a 2H. And H stands for hard. It's a, it's a much harder, thinner uh, lead. So if you were trying to um, keep your lines really light, you could use that. If you wanted uh, soft, smudgy lines, you could use the, 8A, the uh, 8B. And I always think B stands for black. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and then like over here, a little closer to the H, you have your HB, which is your number two pencil. So um, a set like this won't set you back too much, maybe 10 bucks, and uh, you'll have the whole range of pencils, and they'll last you a long time. And then you can kind of um, play around with them, and you'll find there will be a pencil uh, hardness you'll prefer the most. Um, I always like the 2B pencil, um, and I always like the darker ones anyways because I like to smudge. Um, but you'll figure out what you like the most. And I know when I had students that um, would draw too darkly, I would give them one of the H or the 2H pencils because they just couldn't draw that darkly. And vice versa, if you had a kid that was drawing way too light, you'd give them like a 5B and then you can see their drawing. So, you know, you can totally customize it. And then you can buy pencils individually. So when you use one up, you know exactly what you want to replace it with. Um, and really though, that's so either, either one of those pencils, are they, Findable like a AC Moore. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Like no, you can go to AC Moore, even Staples in the drafting section. Oh, okay. So you yeah, might want to look a at a lot of stuff. Yeah, there. you might oh. want to look at a Staples first. And something else I like is um, this is an eraser eraser shield. They're like all of ninety nine cents. And uh, what you do is say you're drawing a drawing, and you um, say you've drawn a cherry, and you want to, and you've colored it in with your with your pencil, and you want to put a highlight. You could like put this little curve on the edge of your cherry and erase. And you get that little highlight. Oh, you could do, it yeah. You can oh. completely control it. And another That's kind of ingenious. Yeah, and another little thing that I don't know if I have one in here because I was looking for it the other day is a kneaded eraser, and it looks like a little piece of clay, and you can like stretch it around to clean it, but you can 
twist it into a fine point if you just want to erase a tiny little thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. And I also like just plain white erasers from the dollar store. The white plastic erasers work really well too. Um, so that's what I would recommend. But don't feel like you have to spend anything. Use what you Good have. Good pencil sharpener. Good pencil sharpener. Good handheld pencil sharpener, which mine's over there because that's where I sit to, uh, that's over there, I sit to color. So good, good sharp pencil sharpener. Okay, that sounds like a good start. Yeah. And Carol says, hey there, I hope you haven't already answered this question. How do I go about making a digital stamp of some of my own original stamp designs? I'd like to make them available in my Etsy shop. Thanks in advance. Hey, Carol. Well, this is a uh, question near and dear to my heart because that's how I kind of started out designing was doing digital stamps. And digital stamps have the benefit of um, being inexpensive, um, available to anybody in the world uh, that has an internet connection mm -hmm. and take up no storage space other than, you know, megabytes on your <laughs> hard drive is all you can remember you can you always put them. make bigger yeah that's right that's <laughs> right um so basically you start with the with the sketch and um you may have like a tablet i'll show you my wacom tablet here i always thought it was wacom but then i heard uh, stacy julian calling it wacom i think oh, wow. so I'm like well stacy julian she's obviously right she yes. would know uh, this is very dusty i don't use this very much because i like to draw <laughs> by hand <laughs> Yikes. Um, but that comes with a little pen and you can draw on it and then your picture's right there on your computer. I have a harder time doing that than I do just drawing it with a pencil. And then I usually go over lines with a pen and get it nice and clean. And um, like a dust moat's all over the place now, floating in my tea. Um, and then um, I will erase my lines if they're kind of messy. And then I scan it into my computer. And then I use a program called Inkscape to trace it and turn it into a vector image. And a vector image is an image that can be made infinitely larger or smaller without any pixelation. It's like almost like a, everything's based on a set of mathematical curves. Um, you don't really need to go to that extreme if you've got a nice clean drawing um, that you can scan in and save. And as long as there's no little smudges here or there, you know, you can erase that and paint shop or Photoshop or whatever. Just make sure you have a nice clean image. And um, I like to provide a ping and a JPEG image, but if you don't know how to make a ping then um then you can just offer a jpeg and just clearly put that in your description that's what you're offering is a jpeg image some people just do jpegs it's there's nothing wrong with that if it's a clean image but when i vectorize it in um inkscape i can export it as a ping image so all you have is black lines and there's transparent background so um if somebody wants to layer that over something um you wouldn't see any white spots or anything like that um so, you know, that's just, uh, the, then you just save it and then you list it in your shop and depending on what you do, you may be uploading your work into a server. So when somebody buys it um, and pays, it automatically is downloaded or they can automatically access a download link. Um, that my shop at my Graphico is set up like that because someone way smarter than me set it up because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, but if you bought something from my shop, handmade shop, you gotta wait till I get around to reading my email and emailing you the file. So, you know, it just depends on, if you're doing Etsy, it's, pro it's probably the easiest way to do it. I, I say like in my shop description that um, please allow, this is a one woman operation, please allow 24 hours for delivery just so that, you know, they're not expecting to see a download link right away. Six minutes, yeah. Yeah, of course you probably can figure out how to set up a, a shop that will automatically download it, but um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't got time for that. <laughs> I can't, I got other things to do. Um, that's that's pretty much it. Draw a picture, make it a nice clean image, scan it in, clean it up a little more if you have to, and then, you know, save it as a JPEG or a ping file. Oh, we're getting there? Getting close? I don't know. Yeah, I think we are. Oh, look at that. It's eight, only 18 minutes. Okay. We're doing yeah. awesome. We're doing this awesome. One, I just didn't want us to have to rush to close because that's... Yeah, that's a drag. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I didn't so. want to interrupt you. I was trying to be discreet. Oh. Just to make sure we... <laughs> what? what are you doing? What are you pointing at? <laughs> <laughs> What's on your wrist? <laughs> Yeah, we, we all know how discreet Lindsay <laughs> um, Yeah, so wow. I think we're going to get a snowstorm. I think we might have a snow day tomorrow. What do you, do you think? really think so? I'm hoping not. I think they've changed really? it. It's only three I, to five inches. I have to say that I, I love snow days. I like having my kids at home. I, I, like, I like the lack of structure. I love my children dearly. <laughs> However, we've had a lot of snow days this year. And yeah, I know. I've got a lot of work cut, to do. I know it is cutting into June, and that's kind of a drag, yeah. but... I don't know, I just think they're cool. I'm thinking that, because we usually film Ask a Crafter during the day, that we should go walking after we're done filming it. We should get our tea in a travel mug, because we usually sit around Gab and drink tea all day. <laughs> we should put our tea in a travel mug and we should we should, we should wander the neighborhood. Yeah, that and, works for and me. And you guys should do that um, too. Sure. We all should do that. And wouldn't we all be healthy, happy crafters? Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Are you with me, guys? Let me know. Give me a thumbs up. Let, leave a comment. <laughs> Let me know if you're in with me with a walking challenge. It's my thumbs up. <laughs> That's like a maybe. <laughs>
Oh, that's no, a... actually, actually, I'm I'm good with that. I'm I'm starting something in in April, and it's awesome. my plan to do the juice reboot thing in May. So awesome. When when Lorraine's done and heads back <laughs> south, and I come back, it might be a newer. Littler version. We're going to wrap it up and say bye and uh, leave your questions below. And until next time, happy.